Hello everybody, Turiosaurus here. Hope you're all doing fantastic. I am doing great. We're back today with another Mountain Blade tutorial video, uh, and this will likely be the last video that we do in this series, unless I get a suggestion down below for something really cool that we haven't touched base on just yet. <clears throat> and as you may notice by the banners up on the walls, and of course the title above the video, the reason that this will be the last video tutorial is that this is kind of the end game content. Today we are going to discuss becoming a king and being a king. So on that note, you'll notice by the banners up above and the tavern on my shirt that this is now a castle that I own. And this is Artiminer. You may remember from our previous videos, Artiminer is our companion who is also an engineer. Just so happened to be the only companion I had with me at the time. So I have appointed him as my uh, guy, I forget what his name is, uh, my minister, yes. So because he is a follower and a minister, there is much that you can do with him. If you choose the option of a, a prominent villager from the local area, uh, which is something you can do, you won't have all of these options though. So that is something to keep keep in mind. Uh, so from here, you can dispatch an emissary, you can ask him if he has any ideas to strengthen our kingdom's unity, uh, you can choose a marshal, uh, you can indict a vassal for treason, which is kind of cool, um, you can ask him to rejoin your party, obviously, and you can grant your fiefs. Um, so I'm going to ask him if he has any ideas. Uh, we will have some items of mutual interest in the future. So, nothing really there. But I would like to dispatch an emissary. Uh, oh yes, I have no vassals, so of course I can't do that. Um, but long story short, I took this castle, so I now own it. I am a king in my own right. Uh, I didn't get a crown. I, I believe I would have to buy a crown or something along those lines. But, when I first got here, uh, and I came into the castle, there was all of about eight uh, of the prospective ladies that you could marry and you had two options when you talk to them one was to let them return to their families and the other was to kind of hold them prisoner I guess um, I chose to of course let them go to their families uh, which increased my relation by one with all of them hopefully thus making it a little better uh, but anywho the town that I took was Sargoth uh, and I took Sargoth for several reasons one of which being that it is a original city. Uh, what what what's important with that is that the only people who have ever owned Sargoth is the Nords, which means that the only people who should be really upset that I own it now would be the Nords. Um, if you take a city such as um, here, we'll scroll out and I'll, I'll show you guys. So another reason that I chose to fight the Nords first is they own a lot of territory. I help them take a lot of this, so I have a good relation with many of the lords, which helps too. But because they're so far spread out, they can't rightly defend a lot of their stuff. Um, so if we were to do this right now, you'll see they're also at war with the Kingdom of the Vagars, which means that they would be fighting this war on two fronts. Um, if we go to Dirham, I mean, this is a city with only 192 people in it. That's nothing. Here's a castle with 56. Uh, 108. Um, in comparison, an old castle, like a castle from the Vagars, has 200. Their city has almost 400 people, plus King Yaraglek. Um, this castle is 199. Ismarala only has 103. So they're spread thin, and because they're spread thin, they will be easier to take. Um, I also own a couple towns now, due to having owned Sargoth. So my first thing will probably be to come out here and try and take Curran Castle. Now what sucks about this is this is one of their old castles, so it's pretty strong, going to be difficult to take it out, uh, and it'll take me a while to build up my army big enough to keep this safe whilst also taking care of uh, current castle. But on that note, you can also, of course, now manage the town and manage the garrison. I am currently building a messenger po post because I would love to know when my castle's under attack. Um, in certain mods, you can also recruit villagers and stuff via your kingdom. And so I could send uh, an emissary out to gather 50 Nord recruits or something like that. 
And then inside of my garrison, I would have 50 Nord recruits. Now, I don't think that you can do that via the, um, ah, uh, but I don't think you can do that via the native version, but many of the mods do include that in there. Uh, it may be something that's included with diplomacy. I haven't done the research on that, but if you're curious, then I would recommend looking at diplomacy first to see if that's a feature of it. And then we can, you know, just kind of move forward from there uh, with figuring out what mod pack, so to speak, you would like to use. Uh, eventually, the native game will get a little stale. It, it was created by a very small group of people, um, possibly only two people. I haven't actually looked into it that far. But because of that, you know, it, it's a little rough around the edges sometimes. But the modding community of this game is amazing, which is why I want to create these videos in the first place to make it easier to get into because once you get past the initial skill threshold this game is amazing but anyways I am going to fortify our kingdom strengthen it up and make the kingdom of Ravenholt one to reckon with and I will be back with you guys once we're a little further into being a king Alrighty everybody, we are back. I have built up our army a little bit. We now have 180 people guarding our city of Sargoth, uh, the capital of Ravenholt. Our party is 101 strong, so not great, but not awful either. They're all max level people. Uh, important thing to note, you might see I have a lot of Rodox and some Serenids, some Hired Blades, Vagers, very few Nords. Now the reason for that is I'm technically at war with the Nords. I know this happens when you are a vassal, I don't know if this happens when you are a king, but you have diminishing um, diminishing morale, essentially, and so my Nords might have low morale, even though they have excellent now, the longer that you're out in the field at war with their country, the lower it gets. So they might have excellent, or they might have low, whereas everyone else is excellent. So the morale down here will say excellent, but I'll still have people abandoning my party. Uh, reason that we've joined back in is I have picked up a party member along the way and kitted him out with as much as I possibly can. So I'm going to see if I can grant him a fief in order to make him a vassal. Uh, so I'm going to grant Ambien to... Ah, yes, yeah, see, he's not a vassal. Um, very well. Can I use this? I don't know why I did that. I'm going to see if I can somehow use this guy in order to make him a vassal. Uh, right, my right to rule isn't high enough, which is basically what one of the problems is here. Mm. All right, well, let's talk to Rolf and see if he will become a vassal. Uh, I'd like to ask you something. Ah, so here we go. So first, I think that you would be the kind of king that well-born gentlemen said would be proud to follow into battle. Would you then support my cause? Of course, Captain, the trick is now to get the others to follow you. Uh-huh. <laughs> so basically, I'm lying about my genealogy. Awesome. Okay, so he is going to go and spread the word of my awesomeness. Let me see if that has officially made him a vassal or not. If it has, I would like to grant him Ambien um, for two reasons. One, to keep him happy, because I don't plan on having many vassals to start with. Yeah, he's not officially a vassal yet. All right, well, he shall return at some point. Uh, in the meantime, I am going to ride out and uh, take out this guy, for one. Make sure that he's not destroying my, uh, my cities and attacking me and stuff like that. Then I'm going to attempt to take Curran Castle, because that is a large force near Sargoth that I just I can't really have going about. Um, and then after a little while of, of going to war and building up our armies and recruiting vassals, I will get back to you guys. Just as a heads up, I will be posting in the 
uh, description down below, a link to a page that kind of explains being a monarch so that you can get into the nitty gritty details a little more yourself should you choose that you should like to rule Calradia one day. Alrighty guys, while I was thinking about it, I did want to bring a couple things up when it comes to vassals and just building your right to rule. So you can of course send emissaries out, you can send your party members on a mission such as I did with uh, Rolf earlier in the videos. Um, however, something to note, when you are doing battles with people, your relationship with them will be affected if you take them captive. Um, and so when you take people captive, you actually end up hurting your ability to let them become your vassal. So once you become a monarch, it is not really recommended to actually capture the enemy uh, Jarls or Counts or whatever they are after defeating them. Uh, so just quick little tip there that I thought I'd bring to your guys' attention. Uh, it seems that Jeremus has returned to us. Um, King Gravath seems to think that we would make a good good ally. Uh, awesome. So I gain a little bit of right to rule there. Uh, right to rule is incredibly important in being a king. Without your right to rule, eventually every kingdom will go to war with you and you will just get destroyed. Now I do have quite a few things under sequestration. That is one of the issues with being at war with, you know, a country that controls like half of the map. Uh, something else to note as well though, um, you will want to think about, um, ah, well that stinks, but you will want to think about your enemy when you choose who to attack first. Now because the Nords are so large, they're a threat to every kingdom. So they're likely going to have many, many people declare war on them at this point, which is a win for me. Ah, and I get a offer of peace. Um, this early into being a king, it's not a bad idea to accept this so that you can build your right to rule. You can also reject it if you feel that you have the ability to take some kingdoms from them and uh, you know win some ground there. It's really up to you. Uh, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to reject it because being at war is going to really help us grow, so to speak. Uh, we can, of course, immediately redo our war, but that's kind of up to us. Um, there we go. So I am now ready to besiege this tower. But anyhow, uh, the reason that I chose to attack the Kingdom of the Nords first is one, because I helped them grow to be so large, they will be under war with multiple people. So currently, as a heads up, they're at war with me, the Rodox, and the Vagers. And so they're at war with three different nations, technically speaking. I'm too small to really count right now because they have no vassals doing war for me as well. But there's two other people who are attacking them, as well as me attacking them, plus they're spread out so thin. So they're in a very weak position right now, which is probably why I got the peace treaty so early. The other thing that I wanted to kind of point out there is if I can take over the land of the Kingdom of the Nords and eliminate them as a faction, I can use my Nordic soldiers without worry of um, them losing morale for being at war with their country because I will then be their country. But I also consider the Nords the hardest faction to eliminate simply because of the Huskarls being so strong. Uh, their shields are thick so your archers aren't going to take them out. Um, your cavalry can only take out one, maybe two of them. Because uh, they're going to get stuck in that group of Huskarls and just get murdered. Each and every unit is technically also ranged because they carry throwing weapons. And then on top of all of that, they are just the baseline strongest infantry there is. And they have archers too. Their archers aren't amazing, but their armor is pretty good. And so, altogether, those guys are just... It's not fun going into a battle against a large group of Nords. Let's just put it that way. I can fairly easily take out a large group of Rodox. Um, they have a wider diversity in their units, which isn't as great. I can get hit with crossbows, infantry, and cavalry. But they're so diverse that really their strength is in crossbows. So as soon as I get up close to them, they're out of luck. I can kill them all myself, pretty much. And then their ranged infantry is taken down, and the others that are remaining are just really easy to kill for my units. Um, but anyways, I'm going to take this castle, and then I will be back with you when something else uh, exciting comes to mind, or when something 
cool happens with the kingdom. Alrighty guys, we are back in the castle and that's because we have received our first vassal offerage. Whilst I was out in the field attacking the Nords and making allegiances with King Graveth of the Rodox and whatnot, I came across a uh, lord who has left King Ragnar uh, and is now asking to be my vassal. So because I had no vassals, I accepted him. And so now we have our vassal, Lord Eric. And in order to keep him happy, I wish to grant him a fief. I'm going to grant him Curren Castle. And he shall like me a lot for it. So that's awesome. Uh, he still can't think of anything to help us out for that. Uh, let's see here. I don't know if I want to be Lord of Suno or not. Um, I currently have Sargoth. I took Suno up here. It had 13 people protecting it. As I said, attacking the Nords because they were so spread out is kind of a good idea for me right now. Um, I wish to gather an army to take out Tyr, but there's a lot of people there. I'd also like to take out Wercheg. Thinking about it, Wercheg probably would have been better to take than Sargoth because I'd just close this off. And then the Nords would have to come all the way down here in order to attack me. Um, yeah, they still hold Dirim. Dirim has 192 people guarding it. It's, it's defeatable. It's just, it's a lot of people for my, my party. I'm kind of starting to become spread thin. Because I am, of course, reinforcing these cities to make sure I don't lose them. Um, but I think I, I will take Suno for myself currently so that I have two cities. And then I will give all of the towns and other fiefs to my, my people. Oh, there's a lady here. Hello, Lady Alfred. Oh, your brother is, um, is the, the guy who just joined us. Fantastic. Uh, you may wish to keep it this way as lords sometimes gravitate towards, oh yeah, that's something to note. If you have fiefs that have no owner, um, it's more likely that you will get lords who um, who will join you um, but anyways just kinda want to let you guys know that we now have a vassal um, it'll probably be a while until he is in his castle but uh, he is currently up here I was up looking for Lord Lord Graveth when I found him but I wanted to make sure that I gave him a fief as soon as possible once um, once I accepted his vassalage, because I don't want to be losing the one vassal I have. Anyhow, I will once again be back with you once I have some more information on how the kingdom is going along. Alrighty, guys, we are back. We now hold several lands to our uh, to our kingdom. We've kind of taken over this little bit of the world, have a couple little outposts out here. The Nords have taken a hit. They hold Wercheg and Tyr still as their original cities, and they still have Dirum and all these castles, so they're still a strong nation, but they're not divided. See, they have this area over here, where they have to go through war and war to get to, and then they have this area over here, which they have to go through a lot of war to get to, their other section, um, and with that they are quite weakened and will likely be taken fairly, fairly down uh, soon. But with that note, I felt that this was a good point to wrap up. I don't want to go into too much detail because then the video would just be too long and I know it's getting long already. But the gist of this is that uh, being a king is of course taking over land. Uh, you can't be a vassal of someone else when you uh, want to become a king. You need to relinquish your uh, right to bear arms in their name and then you take a castle or a town or a city, you know, whatever you want to call them. You take one of those into your own name, thus creating your kingdom. Right to rule is one of the most important things uh, when it comes to to this. It's, uh, what's it? How do you check your right to rule? It's under character report. So currently, right now, my right to rule is at 22. I have two enemies, Jarl Fern and King Ragnar. Uh, currently not reading any books. I am the King of Ravenholt. I have these estates in my name. Lots of renown, good honor rating, which is good, um, unless you're trying to get a lord who dislikes honor as your vassal. Um, 
But anyhow, your right to rule, very important. Sending out emissaries to create allies is a good thing. You know, King Gravith is on my team. He recognizes the Nords as an enemy and joined me in the war against them, which has really helped me take over some castles. Um, making sure that your vassals are happy is a key component to being a king. Uh, when you give one lord or, or one vassal a castle, it will make the other lords angry uh, and vice versa. And eventually they just won't get along and you're going to have lords who defect to other nations. Now, the key there is to keep them all as happy as you possibly can uh, for as long as you possibly can so that the other nations they defect to are quite small. The other thing to note is this is going to take literal years as far as the game is concerned in order for you to take over the continent. Um, it'll probably take I don't know, 20, 30 gameplay years uh, before you've taken over enough of the cities for you to not really be fearful of the other countries. And something to note of that happening is as you condense them down into smaller areas, all of their lords will still have roughly the same sized armies. So when you go to attack a castle or something, if there's 10 lords with full armies sitting in the castle, there's going to be a lot of people. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually you ran into an army that was like 4,000 plus to the battle and it took you like two hours to take the castle. Just something to be aware of. Um, but with that note, I figured I would leave you all and um, just, you know, say that uh, this is being a lord in this game. It is not easy. Uh, it is probably the most difficult part of Mountain Blade. It's much easier to be a vassal and help a country take over uh, everything that way. But it's entirely up to you as to whether you wish to be a king or not. And uh, with that, I think I will leave you where we started off in my castle of Sargoth, the capital of my realm. Um, before we head off, though, one other thing to note. Your capital is not permanent. Feel free to take a city due to its strategic advantages and then move where you keep your capital after that. Um, you simply need a set of tools and a bolt of velvet and you can change your castle's capital or your kingdom's capital rather to wherever you please. Uh, but with that, this is the basics of being a lord. I will once again drop something in the description down below to help everyone understand the finer details of it. Um, but anyhow, I hope that you all have enjoyed. If you have any suggestions for another video, feel free to drop it down below in the comments section. And I hope that you all have enjoyed this series very much, and we'll see you next time.